Good afternoon. Uh, first, I, I'd like to thank uh, Yarden for inviting me to this and for um, really putting together this excellent um, workshop. I'm so excited to be here and to learn from you all. Um, although I will admit, you know, when, when I got the invite, I was a little apprehensive because I said, wow, all these really spectacular experts, you know, what do I have to add? You know, what, what can I really bring? Um, and I guess what I, what I bring is, a uh, a somewhat interdisciplinary perspective. Um, I am both, uh, a law professor and also a sociologist. And I've also, um, had the privilege of working abroad, um, in the IP sector. Um, so I, I've seen sort of, uh, how culture, uh, certainly affects, um, IP regimes and also, um, how, uh, culture creates relationships to IP, uh, both for the holders and for the people who would, uh, want to infringe upon IP. Um, so, uh, you know, my talk is really taking up the mantle from, uh, Jessica Seeley's, uh, excellent, um, presentation, um, in really, uh, examining, um, IP's power to create relationships and, uh, what role the university can play, um, in that dynamic. Um, so first, I, I would like to contrast um, patents with copyright. So the first uh, part of the talk today in the morning uh, really focused on patents, um, and my talk will more focus on copyright law. Um, but 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 first, I, I did want to contrast anecdotically um, how those two differ uh, within the university uh, context. So uh, recently, I was speaking with a grad student um, at MIT. And, uh, and he said something that was a little, uh, perhaps shocking to me naively. Uh, but he said, you know, grad students at MIT, um, and he was think, he was speaking about the sciences here. So he was speaking about patents. He's like, they do not want to actually do the great invention in grad school. Um, and I was like, why wouldn't you want to do your greatest invention in grad school? He's like, well, then you would lose money because you want to, uh, suggest your greatest invention while you're in law school and uh, I'm sorry, while, while you're in grad school. And then once you actually graduate and are no longer subject, uh, to the university having the rights, your invention, you then do that invention that you parlay into a startup, uh, and make very much a lot of money from. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Because when you compare it to the relationship, uh, that universities have to copyright law, right? Because when it comes to social scientists, uh, we don't hold patents, uh, or usually, uh, that, you know, universities can lay claim to. Um, we actually keep, get to keep all the copyrights to our work. So, um, as a sociologist, when I was in grad school, it was very much publish, 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 right? It was very much you want to publish your great work even while you are in grad school because then that will be your academic currency to then get a job. Um, and the fact that you were publishing it while you were in grad school was not a detriment. It was not going to be disadvantageous to you. So it is interesting to see how um, IP uh, in that case is constraining um, what knowledge is shared really uh, within the university context. <clears throat> it is also interesting to think about um, how the university context lays bare um, the tensions within uh, copyright law. So inherent in copyright law is this tension between really access and ownership. Because as academics, we want to disseminate ideas, right? We want people to hear our ideas, both for our own reputation, but hopefully also for the public good. We think our ideas are good. Our ideas are going to benefit society. Um, but on the other hand, we also want to claim ownership to our ideas. Um, and that is actually a, re uh, a relatively recent development for copyright law. Because if you look back at authorship, um, a single authorship or individual authorship is a very recent phenomenon. If you think about the Bible, for example, a work that we would consider canonical, um, it was written by a group of people. Heresy, I know. Um, it was written by God. Uh, <laughs> but you know, truthfully, it was written by groups of people, and it was also rewritten 
which is something that is heretical now to copyright law. The idea that a work can be a living document um, and that can be written by several groups of people and were written uh, for the public good, uh, that is heretical almost to copyright law. So it is interesting to think about that in the context of a university setting that would uh, seem to want to promote collaboration and uh, cooperation. Um, whereas, you know, what we really see is that um, copyrights and um, single authorship is the currency that academics deal in, right? It's how we earn tenure because our, uh, our productivity is really measured by our publications. Uh, and our publications are really seen as the only true measure of our intellectual labor. Uh, so that really does constrain our relationship to our IP within the university and academic setting. So with that, I'll tell you a story. Recently, <clears throat> one of my colleagues, um, not at the same university, but a law professor, um, called me and he was somewhat distraught. Um, so this colleague um, ha had recently learned uh, from some one of his friends that his law review articles had been made into a book. Uh, and this was surprising to him uh, because he had not signed such a contract. Um, but this book was very much a physical object that was being sold in a bookstore in Jamaica, um, a country which he had visited um, and a country uh, in which, you know, he also had done research. Um, and the person selling the book uh, was somebody that he knew and who had um, engaged with him as sort of an intellectual fan. Um, and this person somehow felt it was okay to put um, his uh, law review articles in a collection as a book and to commercialize it. So it was being sold. It wasn't necessarily uh, open, an open access uh, project. Uh, this was <laughs> distressing to him because, you know, first of all, he felt violated, right? He felt that he, his trust in this uh, intellectual fan had been violated, that this someone he had actually engaged in would, um, you know, take advantage of him in a way, in, a, in what he felt was a commercial way. Um, but it was also interesting to him to really consider that this could happen because this was not something that he had really thought about. And this, I would say, is not something that most law professors had really thought about because in the law context, in the legal uh, scholar uh, scholarship context, there is a culture of open access. So unlike perhaps scientific writing, uh, in the law context, most law review articles are posted online for access to anyone. So SSRN is a depository of pretty much most law review articles. Now, there's no requirement by your university that you do so, but there is a culture that sort of um, nudges you to do so. Why? Because once you post uh, your um, article on SSRN, there is a download rank, right? So SSRN um, tabulates how, uh, how many times your article has been downloaded. Um, and this matters uh, for purposes of publication. So most law professors actually post their articles on SSRN prior to publication. And then the download rank is a rank that law reviews use to uh, inform their decision for acceptance for publication. So there's this nudge system in place really for open access, right? Which could, would seem to be a good thing. Like you never really have to pay uh, for a law review article. On the other hand, it now provides this venue for people to co-opt the law review articles, which is exactly what happened in this case, um, and that law review article to become part of a book uh, without the consent or even the knowledge of the true author. Uh, so interestingly, however, in my conversation with my friend, he was really more perturbed by the idea 
uh, of the commercial, commercialization of his work, right? He was really more perturbed by the idea that his work was being commercialized. He was less, yes, he was distressed about the sort of uh, what he saw as a violation of trust um, and really of this rupture of, of what he felt had previously been a good relationship, but he was also very disturbed that people were now being made to pay money for his law review articles that were, of course, freely accessible in SSRN. Um, on the other hand, I actually had to bring up what I felt was a bigger issue, which is, well, have you seen this book? Do you have a physical copy of this book to verify that this book that has your name actually only has all your law review articles without any alterations or supplements, right? Because for us as academics, copyright law isn't really just about protecting our labor. It's not really just a Lockean concept. It's also about protecting our reputation, which is part of our currency, right? So if this work that contains his law review writings was supplemented or altered in some way that would actually cause him embarrassment, alt you know, ultimately that might actually be more commercially hurtful to him than however much money um, the uh, bookstore owner was making from this book. So I had when I reminded him of that, you know, I'm sorry, I added to his distress. Um, but uh, and, 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 and to add to his distress was what could he do? And that's really why he had called me. What are my options? How can I stop this? Well, his options are not really good, right? Because unlike, and this is actually me stepping into the fray, uh, as, as should universities hold patents. Well, I'll leave you with this provocation. Unlike in a situation where universities do own the patent, and will enforce it, and does have the resources to litigate to enforce it. Um, in my friend's case, he's alone. <laughs> he's on his own. His school doesn't have any interest in protecting his copyright, really. So if he wants to stop uh, this publication, he has to fight it on his own. He has to figure out a way to obtain the resources to go to Jamaica and litigate. Um, and the success of this is uh, somewhat uh, un uncertain. So it is interesting to think about what role the university is serving uh, as a holder of IP, um, both for the negative, but really also for the positive and for the, um, for the rights it also uh, affords to the people who are creating the content. Okay. So, um, I guess I'll leave you with one last provocation. Um, we, um, we seem to have an issue with universities holding patents when they are not utilizing it. Right. Um, and a, a previous speaker um, uh, talked about patent trolls and also mission statements and if universities should be held to the mission statements um, of using IP for the public good. Um, I want to give the provocation of what is that public good? What would be the definition of a public good that a university should pursue with its IP? Uh, should it be limited to making money for the university in order to keep running and in order to perhaps be able to offer more scholarship? Um, should it actually be a more global public good, right, in, in which uh, the idea of knowledge transfer is also present? So I'll leave you with that, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much.